Hi, and welcome to 4.3 Net Force. In this lesson, students will be able to describe what net force is. Students will be able to calculate the net force acting on an object, and students will be able to create a free body diagram, or FBD. Not BFD, that's an acronym for something else. So what is net force? Newton's first and second laws refer to the net force acting on an object. I don't have to read them all again. You can see in the bolded words, they say net external force, net force a bunch of times. So now it is time to talk about what is net force. This is the definition. You might want to write this down in your notebook. The net force is the vector sum of all forces acting on an object. So you could either write F sub net like this, or sometimes I'll write sigma F. And I kind of mentioned this before. Sigma in math means sum, and this is the vector sum. You're just adding all the forces together, uh, but remembering that they're vectors, so the direction matters. So it says the net force on an object can be found by using the methods for finding resultant vectors, like I just said. We draw a free body diagram, or FBD, to help add vector sums. We've kind of been doing this since unit one uh, with our vector diagrams, but now we're analyzing forces. So the only real difference is you're drawing a box, and then the forces come, you put the forces on the box. So example, oh my gosh, look at that dog. That is my family's dog. Her name is Dolly. She's the cutest. She's a rescue dog. She's some kind of Rottweiler and something else. Her legs are really short. Very cute dog. Uh, growing up, we had a neighbor who had a full-sized Rottweiler, and that dog's name was Zoe. So Dolly and Zoe would play together, and it would be funny because you'd have a big Rottweiler and a small little Dolly there. So I like to include her in this uh in this slide. It says two dogs, they never fought, but two dogs are fighting over a half kilogram bone. Dolly pulls the bone north with 10 newtons and Zoe pulls the bone west with 15 newtons. What is the magnitude and direction of the net force? What is the acceleration of the bone? So once we find the net force, we could use Newton's second law. And what force should be added to bring the dog bone system into equilibrium. If there was a third dog, uh, it, what force would that third dog have to exert on the bone so that the bone comes to a rest? Or maybe not comes to a rest, but stops accelerating, becomes in equilibrium. So the first step that we want to do is to draw our free body diagram. And I like to draw free body diagrams like this. I draw a box. So I know it says a bone. You don't have to draw a bone. Draw a box. Then I draw a point in the middle of the box. And some teachers just like, okay, just draw the point. You don't need the box. I like to, it helps me visualize it. So I draw both, okay? Then I draw the forces concurrent on each other, meaning they start on the same spot, that dot. So that's what concurrently means. Um, Dolly pulls north. So this is 10 Newtons. And I try to draw them somewhat to scale. And I'll use, so this is the force. I don't know why this is erasing. This is the force that Dolly exerts. So F sub D is equal to 10 Newtons. And north, so this is like an overhead view, and Dolly's pulling north. West is like to the left, 15 newtons. I wish I had like a straight line, boom. Okay, so F, Z, for Zoe, F sub Z is going to be 15 newtons, just like that. Capital N for Sir Isaac Newton, okay? So it says, what is the magnitude and direction of the net force? Now we're t now it's ready to do the vector sum. So how do you add vectors? Head to tail. So we have to redraw the force that Zoe exerted. This is 15 newtons. And then our resultant vector is from start to finish, just like this. And we could call this uh, F sub R for the resultant, okay? Or just R. Um, 
So we're going to have to do the Pythagorean theorem, right? Because this is the right triangle. And my Z's kind of look like twos, so I might do the thing where you put the line there. You substitute in, and then you solve. So when you combine both forces, they're pulling the bone with 18 newtons in this weird direction. So we have to find the direction, and you could find either one you want. Let's use this angle. Uh, we're going to use the inverse tangent with these two sides of the triangle. You substitute in, and then you solve. So this angle is 56.3 degrees. All right, so now that we know the combination of both forces, we're going to use this resultant force to find the acceleration of the bone because it's the two forces together are causing that acceleration. So we'll use Newton's second law, F equals MA. And now we can use our subscript F net, or you could even use the sigma if you wanted to be fancy, uh, either one, or, you know, tech, I'm not going to take off points if you don't write that. But now that we know this is actually Newton's second law, you have to use the net force. And in all the previous problems, there's really only been one force. So you don't have to do this process if there's only one force because there's only one force. Uh, but anyway, so we're going to use that resultant force. 18 newtons is equal to the mass, 0 0.5 kilograms, times the acceleration. Actually, I guess I should have done the acceleration is equal to the net force over the mass. Either way, you're going to get... Uh, 36, 36 meters per second squared. So that's kind of a big acceleration. These dogs are going crazy right now. Somebody needs to come along and slow them down. So to find number three, it says what force should be added to bring the dog bone system into equilibrium? Let's, let's stop them from accelerating, meaning we want the net force to become zero, all right? And how do you make the net force zero? Well, we have this force, the resultant force here is those two combined. What if we added a force completely opposite that? This is our third force, F3 for third force, okay? It has to be equal in magnitude to the resultant force to cancel it out and it should be in the exact opposite direction. So actually we'll use alternate interior angles here, and that means that this, we don't have to do any work. We could just look at our nice free body diagram. This is, I'm gonna squeeze it in 56.3 degrees. What a messy diagram, okay? But you can write, let's see if I advance to the next slide by accident, because my hand is right over the thing. It says F, three is equal to 18 newtons, uh, 56.3 degrees. Uh, that it looks like it's going, so here's south, right? And we're going east of south, that many degrees, east of south. Okay, so this would bring those two dogs into equilibrium. Uh, what is equilibrium, you ask? Let's see. So equilibrium is the state in which the net force on an object is zero. Like we said, everything's balanced out. Objects that are either at rest or moving with constant velocity are said to be in equilibrium. So if all the forces balance out, if the net force is zero, F equals MA the force is zero, so the acceleration is zero. So it's either at rest, constant velocity of zero meters per second, or it's moving with a constant velocity, but it's not accelerating. The acceleration is zero because the net force is zero. So this is Newton's first law. Newton's first law is strictly for things in equilibrium, where there's no net external force. And it's a constant, they should really just say it's a constant velocity. Instead of saying objects at rest remain at rest, objects in motion remain in motion with constant velocity in a straight line. The fact that you're at rest and remaining at rest means you have a constant velocity of zero meters per second. So it's enough to say 
constant velocity. And velocity is a vector, so you don't really have to specify moving in a straight line because since velocity is a vector, direction matters and the direction is constant. So it's moving in a straight line. That's my little thing. Newton should have just said, keep it simple, buddy. All right. It's for things that are in equilibrium that are moving in a constant velocity. Now, if there is a net external force, right? So this is for things that don't have a net external force. If there is a net external force, the forces aren't balancing each other out then Newton's second law comes into play. And the net force isn't equal to zero anymore. What is the net force equal to? M times A, the mass times the acceleration. The, this is, law is for objects that are not in equilibrium. And if it's accelerating, then Newton's second law comes into play. Okay, you could use net force equals MA. Great, nice. So critical thinking, can an object be in equilibrium, but still be moving? Can you think of an example? Pause the video. Think of something that is moving, but in, in equilibrium. Is that possible? Let's see. So here's one example. It's a box. Right now it's in equilibrium. It's at rest. It's not accelerating. Newton's first law is at play. But if you come along and push on the box, that's the only force acting on it because it's a horizontal frictionless surface. Uh, and then we didn't really talk about this yet, but there is gravity. And then there is something called the normal force, F sub N. So, but those two balance each other out. So let's just say that the net external force is equal to this five newtons. So the, it's unbalanced right now, right? It's gonna start accelerating. So you're pushing on the thing. You have a velocity to the right because it's accelerating to the right. It's not in equilibrium. Newton's second law comes into play because you're accelerating and you're moving with an increasing velocity. You're getting faster and faster and faster. Then somebody comes along and pushes with exactly the same force, balancing out your force. Here's this person. Now you already started moving. So they're just keeping you from accelerating further. You are in equilibrium, but your net force is equal to zero. Therefore, you are not accelerating, but you're still moving with a constant velocity. Okay? So that's one example of an, how you could be moving and still be in equilibrium is when you have constant velocity like that. This might make more sense to you. So here's another example. This is me skydiving. So draw a free body diagram for the picture above. Are the skydivers in equilibrium? If so, when? So this actually can be broken down into like four different segments. So the first segment, you're in the plane and then you jump out of the plane. So you're at rest on the plane with respect to the plane and then you jump out of the plane and you start accelerating downward. So here's our free body diagram. What forces are acting on you? Well, you definitely have gravity. We'll call that F sub G. And did you see my face in that picture? Let's not neglect air resistance. Air resistance is super important when you're skydiving. So we'll draw in the force of air, F sub air. That doesn't say fair, that says F sub air. Okay, this is not fair. So in this case, your weight is greater than your air resistance for now. When you start moving out of the plane, all right, you're going to start accelerating. Your net force is downward. So you accelerate downward. That means that you're moving downward. Your velocity is downward. And you're speeding up because the velocity and the acceleration are pointing in the same direction. You're getting faster and faster and faster. And you say, ah, oh my gosh. I'm jumping out of, I just jumped out of a plane. Why did I do that? All right. So um, now the thing about air resistance is, and it's super important, the faster you go, we're getting, we're speeding up. We're going faster and faster and faster. The faster you go, the more air resistance you're going to have. So that's important for this next step. The faster you go, the greater the air resistance. Uh, you could feel the air on your face. It's blowing your cheeks really hard. It's getting more and more air resistance, okay? And it happens pretty fast. So then you reach your terminal velocity. And the terminal velocity, we're speeding up. Our velocity is getting greater. 
until you reach this point. Then the velocity remains constant. Why? Because our weight didn't change. We still have the same force of gravity, but our air resistance increases until it is exactly equal to the weight. Now, why doesn't it continue to increase after that? It's because your weight is equal to your air resistance. That means your net force is zero, okay? And if your net force is zero, that means your acceleration is zero. And that means that you're not speeding up anymore. The reason this got bigger was because we were going faster. Now the net force is zero, so we're not accelerating, but we're still moving downward. Like it's not like we come to a stop. We're moving downward uh, with a constant velocity, which means we're in equilibrium right now. So this is that example from the critical thinking question. Um, can you be moving but still be in equilibrium? Yes, I'm definitely falling downward very fast, but my forces are balanced out and I'm not accelerating anymore, but I'm still moving downward. And I'm saying, oh, awesome. This is really cool, actually. Oh my gosh. All right, the initial shock of going from safe in the plane to outside has worn off and you're realizing that you're falling through the sky and it's beautiful, but terrifying. So it's time to pull the parachute. Deploy your chute. Now you have this big canopy above you. And what does that do to your air resistance? Your air resistance is super big now. Your weight stays the same, but luckily your parachute it has a bigger surface area, so it increases the force that the air is exerting on you. And what do you think that's gonna do to your motion, right? So now Fg is less than F air, which means your net force, if you added these together, the net resultant force would be upward. Now, your acceleration is upward because your net force is up. And what happens? Your acceleration is up, but you're still moving downward. You don't shoot up in the air. Your velocity is still, you're going towards the ground still. But what happens is you're slowing down because your acceleration and your velocity are pointing in opposite directions. And we said that means you slow down. Luckily, right? So the parachute helps you. It slows you down. And it slows you down really fast. So you're like, oh, oh my gosh, that harness really took a number on me. It feels like the wind is knocked out of you because uh, it happens so fast. Uh, then you're peacefully gliding. Oh, enjoying the scenery. Now your parachute is deployed. You're swinging all over the place. It's very nice. So what's happening here is you still have your weight, but it's equal to your air resistance and you move down at a constant velocity. So the weight is equal to the air resistance. The net force is zero. You're no longer accelerating and you're still moving downward, but much slower. Okay. So then you could land safely. Phew. Very nice. So that's kind of like an example of when you could be moving downward, but still be in equilibrium because your net force is zero. So I have one more example here. This is kind of an honors example. It's talking about tension. It says a sign in is hanging from two strings as shown in the diagram below. This is the sign I'm going to have outside of my storefront one day when I open up Phys X and people come in to learn about physics and pay me money, I guess, maybe. No, this is the sign out front where I make this. I'm making my YouTube videos right now in a, in a storefront and I have this out. No, I don't know. The weight of the sign is 50 newtons. What is the tension in each string? So tension is just kind of like the force along each string. Tension is just another name for force when it happens in the string. That's good enough for us. So the first step you want to do is draw yourself a free body diagram. So here is the free body diagram. And I kind of always start with the weight. The weight doesn't act at an angle like that. It points straight down. So we have something called F sub G. Then we have these two strings pointing at angles like this. They're actually equal angles. I'm not going to get too crazy about it. Let's call it T1 and T2. They're at 40 degrees here. Uh, and actually, so I'm going to give it away. We're going to break these into components. So I might as well do that now. T1X. And this is T1Y. And this is 40 degrees. Same thing over here. Very identical. Very symmetrical. T2. 
2x and t2y. Does it have to be symmetrical? Will there ever be a problem where it's not symmetrical? Yes, that could happen. But right now we're starting like this. Okay. So it's at rest. All right. It's so that means all the forces are balancing each other out. It's in equilibrium. And we just broke these into x and y components. So when we draw our when we write down our net force, we're going to first write the net force in the x direction, T1x and T2x, those are balancing each other out. And then Fg is balanced out by T1y and T2y together. So that's kind of the strategy for this. So we'll write the net force. And when I do these net force equations, I kind of, for whatever reason, I like the sigma F there. The net force in the x direction is equal to well, T2x is going in the positive direction. So let's start there. T2x and T1x is going in the opposite direction to the left. So we'll go minus T1x. Okay. Now, what do we know about the net force? The forces are balancing each other out. So the net force is equal to zero because this thing is at rest and it's remaining at rest. It's not accelerating. What do we know about T2x and T1x? Uh, well, we know that we can do the shortcut method. So T2x is equal to T2 cosine theta uh, and minus T1 cosine theta. And we could, it happens to be the same angle, but we could do that. So zero, well, really we could say, now we'll add it to both sides, T1 cosine theta is equal to T2 cosine theta. It's the same angle, so that allows us to do this trick. Boom, boom, they cancel each other out. And we just proved what we kind of already knew. T1 is equal to T2. These two vectors are equal to each other, and this is the proof for that. Now we're going to do... Um, the net force in the y direction. So in the y direction, we could write the net force in the y direction is equal to, these two forces are pointing upward. So I'm gonna say T1y plus T2y. These two forces that are acting together are balancing out Fg the force due to gravity, the weight, which is pointing downward, so minus Fg, okay? Now, we know, again, it's not accelerating in the y direction, so that means the net force should be equal to zero because it's in equilibrium. T1y is equal to T1 sine theta, uh, and actually, for theta, we know a number. I'm going to start plugging in numbers. Sine 40 degrees, okay, plus T2 sine 40 degrees. I guess it would have been better to plug in because I called this T2 and T1. We could have left it like that uh, and just plugged in 40 because we knew that. Uh, and then they would have canceled out a little bit cleaner, but that's fine. Anyway, minus 50, 50 newtons, okay. This is what makes it a little bit more interesting than the, the x direction. In the x direction, we only, we only have the tension to work with, but in the y direction, we have a little bit of extra information, and we will be able to solve for the tension. Why? Because we know that T1 is equal to T2, so we'll have just one equation and one unknown if we rewrite it like this. This is going to be super clean now. I just said T1 is equal to T2. So we could say T1. I'm really just rewriting everything. Sine 40 degrees. The only thing I'm changing is this. T2 is equal to T1. And this is great because now we only have one unknown in our equation. And we could solve from here. So I just added 50 to both sides, and then I combined those two like terms. So that's two. So you do T1 is equal to, well, 50 divided by two is 25. 25 divided by sine 40, which is about 38. Oh, that's eight. 38 
0.9 newtons. And I rounded that, right? So I have this in my calculator. It's really 38.893, blah, blah, blah. Um, which is also, so since T1 is equal to T2, T2 is also equal to 38.9 newtons. So there's that answer. There's this answer. So these are both equal to 38.9 newtons. And that's the answer to the problem. If you really wanted to check the work, you could plug in over here and over here and you'll get zero when you when you do that um, when you add everything together you'll still get zero so that's proof that okay I did this right and the tension is really equal to 38.9 newtons so wasn't that a lot of fun I know it was thanks for watching and have a great day